Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, my name is Jonas, and uh, I travel around hackerspaces. I was part of funding the Noise Bridge in San Francisco, but the day we got, or the month we got the place, I moved to Australia, and we didn't have a hackerspace, so I went to some meetups and uh, talked about makerspaces, and they just meet in pubs and talk about makerspaces there. But suddenly somebody had a house which he wasn't using, so we got to use a house. And then I moved to Hong Kong, and they had no place. Um, they had a meetup once a month, and I said, well, why don't we just come and talk about making instead of talking about we want to talk about making? <laughs> uh, and let's meet once a week instead of once a month. <coughs> and that's how we got started. And suddenly when people are doing something, you have maker spaces. So I, I, I like it. It's great. Is it Dim Sum Labs? Yeah, Dim Sum Labs, yes. So I, I've been in a, your old place, which was near the, the, uh, the temple, right? The, yeah, the, uh, the mosque. Uh, the mosque, yeah. That's a beautiful area, I think. Yeah. It was a Swedish restaurant nearby, so uh, yeah. i get it this time. <laughs> yes. So I like making, I like playing with stuff. I used to work at Google, and I built data storage for s cloud and, and so on. Um, and it's big, but it's also small. Because when something is so big, it has to be small. And that's why I like microcontrollers. So I'm playing with something called the Node MCU. How many have heard about the Node MCU? So Node MCU is like just a USB breakout board for the ESP8266. And maybe even more people heard about that one, right? Uh, but I really like the Node MCU because you just connect to it and it just works. And you compile your C code or, or you can do other things. So um, uh, how many have been using C for it or Arduino IDE? So we have a few there. How many play with the, uh, um, it comes with Node, uh, which is the uh, uh, Lua, the Lua interpreter. Uh, so few people try to use that one. I tried to use it because what was what was available, but you get stuck in it because it actually runs out of memory very fast. You write a few function, and each function you define in source code for in Lua, which is a high-level language, takes about 800 bytes, Oof. and you have about 14 kilobytes. So you define eight functions, and you're out of memory. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, no, I can't do that. But it, it was really happy to have it in the beginning or to play with it. So I thought, like, what, what do I want with this device? Well, I want it to be a program. I want to program on the device. So I want it to be interactive. And actually, the, uh, the uh, uh, Lua works fine, but it's kind of tedious to upload files and so on. And I thought, like, which environment is good for this? Well, Forth is one language. And, and Lisp is a very old language. And I thought, wow, what if I could take this chip? And maybe I could also, this is in the future, find a LCD display, which is big enough connected to this, and maybe connect an old uh, keyboard to it. Then I would actually have a small computer, um, which wouldn't be a general purpose computer. It would be a programming machine. So you could program on the go. It's almost like a laptop, but without the web browser. Um, and I think it could be interesting for people who want to learn to program, because it's a thing you only program on, and it's not finished. So you can do a lot of things yourself, and it's not difficult to do it. right? So this comes back to the idea of uh, Lisp machines and stuff like that. But to, to get back to, uh, to uh, the making of these things, um, so um, I, I said, I can write a better language. I can write a Lisp. And I haven't written a Lisp for 10 years, so I thought it was time to do it again. And so how many people know Lisp or Scheme or Common Lisp? And you put it on the old guys. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, kind of. It's, it's a very interesting language to learn because it changes the way you're thinking. And programming computers and small computers is changing your way of thinking from programming bigger computers, right? And, and so you need to be taking care of resources. And, and uh, um, <coughs> Lisp is a very interesting language because it's very compact to do something powerful, right? And it's pretty high level in the way you uh, can program it, right? Because you're not bogged down with the memory allocations and stuff like this. Um, um, so just learning it for the course of learning it itself is actually worthwhile for, you become a better programmer in C++ and in, in uh, Java, Script, and anything else if you learn this. Um, I, I'd agree with you, but you know, uh, the implementing the Lisp interpreter is a very big challenge if you want to be uh, frugal on memory. I used to 
blow the stack space out on the top twenty with with yes. You time. can do that. You can do that. But it's it's interesting. Uh, so so um, uh, there's a few few features of the Lisp. So my my goal is to be a better al environment than the Lua for for programming, right? And and I concentrate on speed. So I'm like two times slower than Lua on the device for a simple loop. But I I pushed it down so that I handle like something called tail recursion. I don't know if people know what this is. This is when a function call itself. And it doesn't wait for the return value. And this doesn't grow the stack. <coughs> and GCC is a compiler which is intelligent enough to handle this. And newer compilers can handle this these days. So I had a number of goals with writing this thing. Like it would be an alternative environment. But I want it to be so far self-hosted that you can connect to the device and program it. And as I said, maybe make a home computer again where you want to program on it rather than playing games and downloading software and installing it, right? So maybe people would actually write their own web browser or web server and stuff like this. Um, so um, some of the design goals are embedded small Lisp. And there's a several challenges to this because I don't know if anyone used the uh, ESP and you try to do something more than just sending data from it. You maybe you read a web page, you try to scrape something, and suddenly you can't use the parser. Yep. You actually have to go and get what you want, where you want it, and yep. you have to write your own kind of specialized code, which is, which is cool, actually. Um, so you have to be memory efficient. There's yep. 40 kil kilobytes of RAM available when you start your program, but all the libraries and uh, standard I or printf, they all take up uh, a lot of uh, 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 memory. So you end up with usually about 14K available, I think, on the Lua. And uh, I'm about maybe 20k k available. Uh, some of it is allocated for usage uh, from in the Lisp. Um, so uh, everyone who doesn't know Lisp knows JavaScript, maybe. Yeah. Um, so JavaScript has something called closures, which is a when you return a function, which is going to be called later. And and this is a very fundamental to Scheme, which is a variant of Lisp, which uh, makes it's kind of an object orientation DIY. You do it yourself. And so object orientation in Lisp doesn't require you to have a lot of libraries or anything. It's just, you just do it. You just create an object and you can send messages to it. And uh, it makes people really understand what they're doing. Um, people have used the Lua. They know that you have kind of a terminal interface. So you can type and edit. Um, and you want to be able to easily add functions to this language, right? So the first working variant was a thousand lines of C code. So Lisp is not bigger than a thousand lines of code. Wow. And, and so if you're going to do a really, really big project, and it's very difficult to build, first you should write the Lisp, and then you write your project inside the Lisp. This will be less code, and you'll be f done faster than actually <laughs> trying to write your stuff in C++ to start with, quite often, if, if, you, uh, uh, if you're used to this kind of way of thinking. Um, so these are some, some nerd features which only make sense to... to uh, I, I don't want to mess up your... your sure. So uh, 1,000 lines, basically the, the, basic, the basic scheme and <coughs> all your basic functions. So then you're writing C code for like direct hardware control of specific uh, bits, which you might add on. Right. And it's then you make, make basically make, make dedicated loop functions, hard-coded <coughs> functions for things that are going to deal with I.O. And well, I don't have all those parts yet, right? But so I mean, that's yeah, the idea. that's the idea. So I have a, a simple one where you can uh, read an input pin and write an output pin. It's all a matter of if I have underlying functions available in C, then I can add it, right? So currently, I'm using something called uh, ESP Open RTOS, which is a not operating system, but it has operating system tasking facilities, and it can do uh, interruptible code and so on. I'm not using all of those features, but it's a, it's a nice framework for compiling stuff. And, um, but I'm thinking about moving to another one because they say like, oh, you probably could connect PWAM stuff to it, but we don't have an example code. And when you say, like, you take some example code and it doesn't work. And, and actually, you take Arduino code, it always works because somebody else wrote it and for your platform and it works, right? right. So I'm thinking about switching it over. But it's, it's a very portable C code because I run it on, on Unix on uh, a Linux uh, to a develops, and then I just move it, I flash it to the device, right? So, um, uh, okay, so let's get <coughs> to something real. 
Um, here is just the files, and it's it's essentially just two files at the few files at the moment. So, so the the most important one is is uh, Lisp.c. I started with one file, and then there's some some drivers to uh, to make it uh, understandable, right? Um, comments. There's a lot of geeky stuff in it. How I store data. So, for example, I try not to allocate things on the heap. So an integer is stored inside the object pointer. Um, and this makes you save a memory allocation, because how much does a malloc cost in memory from a heap? You malloc one byte. How many bytes does it cost? Oh, yeah, because you have ten. overhead. Probably 10. Uh, well, it's aligned on eight bytes, typically. So you will at least allocate always eight bytes. Right. And so it needs four bytes for the next pointer, three pointers, and, and memory sizes. So you end up uh, wasting seven bytes, right? So, so in this case, you don't even allocate the integers. Um, but it also means the integers are a little bit smaller. But usually, you loop <coughs> over smaller numbers. Um, so um, then there's a number of data structures. Um, don't want to go too much into that storage. But um, one thing very, very s important with the Lisp. So, so let's let we're just going to run the Lisp here. It's not running on the device yet. By just compiling it and, and running it on the command line. And so we start it, and here we have a Lisp. And uh, Lisp is prefix notation. So you say first what you're going to call, and then the arguments. And actually, if it was C, the equivalent would be this. Yeah. It's also prefix, actually. But for some reason, people think that Lisp is full of parentheses. So please count how many parentheses are over here. There is one, two, and one, two here. But there's an extra comma here, and I don't understand what comma does. Hmm. It's, it's um, only full of parens because yes. of the, in the nature of, of uh, yes. embe embedding functions and functions and functions. Yes. Now, here is the thing. You don't write this in Lisp, right? So in Lisp, you actually have to tell the computer what to do. So you say that you actually want to do a pr plus three os of uh, five times six or whatever it was I was doing, right? And actually, this is the parse tree of, yeah. of yeah. your other thing, right? And this is what makes Lisp powerful, because your program is data. Mm. And a Lisp interpreter is interpreting data, which happens to look like Lisp. So it's, it's, it's a program by definition. And therefore, it's a self-thinking machine. No, it's not intelligent in any way. It's so dead simple that you can write a Lisp inside a Lisp in less than uh, 50 lines of code. It's like uh, maybe 20 lines of code. And, and so, uh, so this is uh, the, the magical part of it. Now, Lisp has this strange thing that things are symbols. So symbols in Lisp are really important. Um, so I'm using a function called setQ. And I can say foobar, and it's free. So now we have a symbol defined as foobar. And when I evaluate a value, it's free. So I can say plus foobar. And now this will be 6, right? Um, now, um, this also has something called function. But we don't call it a function. We call it a lambda. And uh, a lambda is, let's say we call a function uh, xxx. And we say lambda x. And I want to hear from somebody who doesn't know Lisp what this does. Right, it just takes an x. It's a function taking an x and it returns um, x yeah. plus x. And we give it the, this, this, the lambda actually evaluates to an expression, which is a function. So it's already uh, object oriented because functions are objects. And then we put that function inside the xxx. And uh, OK, this is a, the, the old one. So we can give it a number. And now we just create an abstraction in this language, right? Um, so how do you do uh, other things which are not plus? Well, you don't really do anything else than plus in Lisp. You just call functions. And there's a function called um, if. So um, um, we can say if 3 is equal to 3, then we want to return 42. 
otherwise return 9. So this returns 42. And if it's not true, then it returns the, uh, the third value, right? So this is, this is all you need, kind of, to do a lot of stuff, OK? Um, that's a very simple syntax, right? Now, how about we, we want to not return the number 42, but we actually want to call, call a function, which we already defined, which is called xxx. And we want to call it on 42 if it is equal, right? So this will give us 84. Right. I'm lucky today because no bugs, apparently, my list. So um, this is programming, right? Now, does anyone know a function which calls itself? Cursive. Right, a cursive function, right? So let's do some recursion. And which function do we always define when we do recursion? Fibonacci. Fibonacci, yes. So um, call it f. And so it takes an n. And if n is equal to 0, we return 1. And otherwise, we multiply n by calling the function named f with n minus 1. And here is where everyone goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I hate Lisp, I hate parentheses, I have to count them. Um, at the moment, I have an interesting bug that when I get to the end of line, I just pad it with as many parentheses as there is. So you can't write multiple lines at the <laughs> moment. So there's not too many parentheses. You only start a few, and you don't need to end them if it if it's ends. Now, this is much li lighter when or easier when you have an outline and you have an editor, and, and so uh, I'm working on that too. Um, uh, so now we have a function called f, and um, it should actually show the name here. So, so it's an older version of the software. And uh, f of 0 is what? If n is equal to 0, then we return 1, right? So, wow, we're lucky today. <laughs> How about 1? How about 6? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Five. So it's just 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6. Yeah. So it's 4, 7, 20, not 4, 20. Um, now, we can do this on a really big number. And um, let's do it on a really, really big number. Wow. And <coughs> you are royally screwed. Why does it still work? And it didn't. And then I rebooted. Um, and this is actually error message from... Um, my machine, because I put in a limit where you can only recurse to certain depth. Sure. And this is not us running out of C stack, it's running out of another stack, which I use for garbage collection purposes. OK, so now we've been um, swimming around enough in the uh, non-real non world. So let's get to a more real world than a simulated world on a computer. We, we will actually connect to um, maybe a device. Let's see if we can do that today. So here we do. Here it is, a Lisp. So um, a sweet secret function I have is called mem. And it actually gives me some stats here. It tells about what's allocated, freed, and blah, blah. Some geek stuff and the number of cons cells available. So I only have 485 cons cells available. So you can only have um, a few elements in a list, a few hundred, uh, before you run on memory. We have 13k free. And that is not used by consoles. So if you allocate consoles, this is actually still free. This just can be used for things like strings, which you allocate. Uh, one thing we saw is that we, we can create function, we can create names of functions, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to allocate those strings too. Yeah. Actually, you don't need to. You store them in the pointer too. If a name is uh, up to six character, mm -hmm. six characters in A to Z can be stored inside 32 bits. Because it's five bits yeah. is A to Z is 32 characters yeah. uh, possible, and five times yeah. six is 30, yeah. and then I have two bits left over, which tells you that this is an atom stored inside the pointer. So yeah. the pointer actually doesn't point to anything. Yeah. So this saved me two kilobytes yeah. of RAM. Yeah. Otherwise, this would actually say uh, how much memory I have: 13k. Yeah. So it used to say 11k before I did that. So this like tricks like this, which makes it really cool. Now, um, so we can test this 
we can say foo bar, and we actually didn't allocate anything, but it's the same foo bar fi fum. It's a longer name. Right. Let me see. If we have al one allocation of twenty nine bytes, yeah. and they still use twenty nine bytes because an atom never gets thrown away because it's it's a global inquiry. How many minutes? Okay. So um, now let's let's see if we can do something more fun here. We create a function f Fibonacci again, uh, and lambda n if n equals to 0, return 1. Otherwise, it's n times f minus n1. OK, so and then I think it's plus, I think. Huh? I think the Fibonacci sequence is plus and not times. Same. So it's, yeah. it's plus? Yeah. It's oh, some yes. Oh, really? This is faculty function, actually. So <laughs> yes, so it's faculty function. Sorry. It's an F function. Yeah. <laughs> right? Still F. F what I know. Still F. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yes, it's still F, right? So <laughs> good points, good points. Multiplication is more expensive, so it's more fun to do oh. it, right? <coughs> so we can still test that it works. Uh, and this is actually probably where both of those functions would be the same, right? So we can do F6. Mm -hmm. Now, let's do something more fun. We can say trace on, and then we run it. So let's do it on a smaller value, oh, f1. <laughs> so here it actually shows you all the function call we do in, f, in the VAR. So f1 is called, and then this is an expression being evaluated. So you can follow and debug your program. Right. And you can each point see what value is being returned. So here's zero return. True is returned for the equal sign, right? So n equals zero is true. And then you have one, 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 one are being returned top up, right? So you can do things like this. Now, I have a built-in function called Fibo, Fibo, Nachi, and it, um, yeah, <laughs> it's doing a lot of work. Yeah. It's a good test for, for, for everything, right? Um, control C. Actually, it's finished. So let's do it. Let's turn on off the tracing, and we do Fibo 10. And that was really fast, yeah, suddenly, because right? Printing is because printing is what makes your program slow. So yeah. you can, we can ta time it. So it took zero, zero sign. Uh, so let's do 22. Let's take some more time. Yeah. Mm. That's 22 recursions, actually. Um, so that took 1930 millisecond. And you can just see you increase it by one. It takes. Uh, so now we're talking about uh, Fibonacci. Fibonacci is different because it's not one recursion, it's calling itself twice with two different values. So it's really like the worst complex algorithm you can design on the computer. So it's really slow and you increase one number, it takes almost double time, right? So uh, this time function is, is a way to, to really uh, be able to, uh, to test, test these things. Now, that's only took a uh, certain time. So now we're looking at this. Okay, what is my computer doing? Oh, what's it doing? Control T. Control T. Control T. Control T. So we see here actually a small stack being printed. And the load is 0 0.99. And it says that we have a time function calling 20 Fibonacci or 23 Fibonacci. So this means Fibonacci is calling itself 23 times on the stack. And so you can kind of see what's going on and, and see that it's responding, right? So uh, this is kind of fun to, uh, to run this way. So it means it's not dead when it's doing something. And the overhead of this check, it only tests every few uh, hundred milliseconds. The overhead is not even 1% to add this functionality, right? And most, most computers will not, uh, not respond uh, while, uh, while you're doing this stuff, right? So, OK. So if we do this again, we can do Control T. We can do Control C. Okay, now how many people have been uploading programs to it? Ah, you have to do. So you have to add a path for Tenslack compiler. <coughs> and I say we're gonna put um, a later version on it. Actually, that's not, that's not the latest version. Let's get the super latest version. CDSP hash. And that didn't work. Okay. 
Let's do it for hardware. So, ESP Lisp is available on GitHub, and you can download it, and you can run it on your machine. But you can also uh, download the whole environment for, for this one and compile it yourself. Or you can get a flash image from me, right? So this is um, a good way to play with it. Um, so 24%, 27%, writing, 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 writing. This is really tedious. It's kind of fun because you're doing something really complicated. But um, you change one function in your code, and it takes like a minute to upload it and test it again. That's why using a Node MCU, using Lua, using Lisp would make your programming much easier. You just edit the function which, which you're changing, right? So OK, I'm almost out of time, I think. Um, but I wanted to see if we can run this one like this. So we see it's still doing that. But to do Control-C now, it actually shows you the stack of all the calls and what the parameters were. So you know where you are. So this could actually be simply made into a debugger where you look where you are, and then you could continue. You could single step once you put a Control-C in it. And this is actually a debugging added without any overhead to the interpretation really being done at the moment. Um, I'm happy for people to play with this Lisp and contribute functions. And particularly, we need to add more hardware functions for it to, to make it really playable. Uh, at the moment, there is a, there's a function called in, one function called out. You give it a pin number, and you can set or read a, a value. Um, so that's uh, the main thing. Yeah? Can you run multiple instances of this? Uh, yes, I have a dual core ESP8266 here. It's two node MCUs. So I used to have a quad core, but then I sold two cores. <laughs> <laughs> what, what shows up? The last instance? Or uh, what, instance? Um, what do you mean, instances? When you press Control T, it shows there. Right. It, in this case, it just prints a stack and exits. But it doesn't actually need to exit when you print the stack. It could continue. And it's actually, you could tell it to print the stack continuously. And you can see it grow and shrink it because it clears the screen before printing it out, which is uh, uh, quite fun. So one could really make an interactive environment on it where you, your program is stored here. Um, one of the things I want to do now is that when you write a Lisp program, it takes space. And I want to make it that you write a function, and I write it to flash memory, which means the RAM will not be used at all. And as long as all your function names are six characters or less, A to Z, it will take no RAM at all almost. And, and so it will be stored in Flash. And this enables you to, uh, to write really big programs and change them and without actually using RAM. RAM will just be your data, your hardcore data. So it won't take any space. And, and that would be one major advantage according uh, relative to the Lua thing. So yeah. You've been talking the entire time about your Lisp interpreter. Sorry, yes. So what's, what's your day job? My day job is. Um, People ask me what I do, and I say, as little as possible. <laughs> I only do things which is fun at the moment. I used to build cloud stuff at Google, storage, um, um, big and small. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to build big database systems. But at one point of time, I was in IBM, and I built tiny databases, which ran on Palm Pilot in, uh, in 2000. Uh, yeah, 2000. It ran on Sony Ericsson and, and other embedded devices like Sony and so on. And, and, but small and big is the same thing. Because once you have something small, you need to be frugal about <coughs> memory. When you build a database, it stores a lot of data. You need to be very frugal about memory because you want to store a lot of data in it, right? So it's the same problem. <laughs> it, it's just two extremes and the same ext yeah. same usefulness is of that. Yeah. So I think in, in principle, there's a in in, in reality, is a sweet spot, right? Of which yeah. you know you you've optimized to a certain point where. You're not, you know, breaking your back every time you need to, mm. you know, think about uh, yes. the limitations of, of some of the trade-offs. I try to optimize for fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not having fun, and you're not paying me an awful lot of money, I won't be doing it. <laughs> right. So um, this is fun so far. Good. Very interesting project. Yeah. Um, Right, uh, so I think Eunice will definitely hang around. Sure, sure, sure. I'm happy yeah. to yeah, yeah. talk to everyone and know what you're doing because. <laughs> That's what a hackerspace is, but it's not. So we'll continue with the lightning talks.